Hi everybody, I'm Lex from Dead Gentry. I think William will be with me in a minute. And this is going to be not one of our live action videos where we go over appraisals and show you objects like in real time, but instead it's gonna be slides with just us talking, specifically for friends who have asked over and over again for when they're beginning physical vending, which is something William and I have done a lot of in a lot of different venues tons of different places so they were hoping for some insights into that so if you're more into looking at the collectibles and figuring out how to appraise them and seeing the objects maybe hit the like button and then skip the video <laughs> and jump ahead but so this is going to be us talking about this it's not going to be a video like that having said that you may have noticed if you're one of our viewers that we had a to like a toys video that we put up like last week, I believe, which we've already deleted. Unfortunately, we mentioned a place in that video, which is kind of ironic, that we were going to have a, a vending booth from and we're already not in that location and have no intention of promoting them. We actually deleted the whole video when we found we couldn't edit that section out so that we would not promote them in any way. So if you're wondering why that video got deleted, that's why. And if you remember where we talked about, and I'm not going to promote them ever again, so I'm not going to say the name again. But if you happen to remember it, please don't patronize there. Or if you do patronize there, in no way think that we, we are of the opinion that you should. It was a, it was a, a truly awful experience, truly you know, awful practices and policies in place by the owner, by management, towards vendors, towards customers. It was bad. We didn't even want our brand associated with it. So I just have to mention that. And hopefully that'll be the end of that dark cloud inside of the podcast. So back to what our friends asked us for, which is one of them is uh, looking to do a, a moving vending that's more of like you'd call it a mercantile or perhaps like a farmer's market type of artisanal uh, where it moves from location to location and they're paying a fee in advance to work at certain locations and sort of like they, they bring like a shade and they have tables that they set up and that sort of a thing. And then another friend was asking for when you're selling in physical locations like antique malls or like vintage malls, like having a vending booth where you go sign a contract or pay rent for the space, whether it's a wall or a room or by the square foot. And they wanted some tips and tricks on how to do that and how to get into that process and what to watch out for. So, and since this just happened to us where we've, I mean, we've done it all. We've done flea markets, we've done farmer's markets, we did, you know, we've done mercantile, we've done, you know, the, the big, big rummage fairs, very small venues. We've done actual brick and mortar where we have an entire space to ourselves, like actually leasing a retail space, which is a very big process. But we've also done where we have booths or areas within, say, a vintage mall and you pay rent by the month. Sometimes there's a commission. We've done that as well. We've done all of these things. We don't do them all anymore, but we're still at quite a few physical locations. So we have a lot of experience in it. The first thing I'm gonna say, whatever the physical space is that you're thinking about paying a fee to go sell your goods within, is that you check the place out before you sign up, before you pay, before you fill out paperwork, any of that, before you even call. Even before you call whoever's running the event or maybe owns the space, go as a customer. You want to go two different times, probably morning and night, depending on which days they're open. Think of it the way you would think of when you go to buy a house, right? You don't just go when the real estate agent shows you the house on the pretty spring afternoon on a Wednesday at 2 p.m. when there's no noise or traffic in the area. You do that, but then you also go on a weekend at night and you go early in the morning on a weekday because you want to get a real sense for the area and what's going on there. Same idea here. So if they're open seven days a week, a lot of places aren't, then you're gonna wanna go at different times of the day, depending on their hours and different days. Like what does a weekday compared to a weekend look like? And if it's say like a farmer's market or, or moving mercantile fair or something like that, where you're maybe vending from an outdoor space, it might only be say on a Friday or a Saturday, maybe it's a two day event, something like that. Go in advance as a customer. You're looking for things like foot traffic. Is it 
a nice, clean, safe setup. You know, ask the people working there if they're profitable. You can talk to vendors at these events, especially if you're attending as a customer who's interested. They will tell you the truth. Nine times out of 10, if they are not associated directly with management or ownership, vendors will tell you a truth about a space, whether it's a farmer's market or an antique mall. You know, they'll, tell, they'll, they'll be thrilled to tell you if they're profitable. They'll, they'll brag about it. And we like to. <laughs> no, I love it here. It's, the, it's one of the best places I've ever vended from. Oh, it's great. You make such great friends. And they'll tell you if it's not. They'll tell you if it's like a farmer's market. Maybe you have to sign up in advance for like six months of the year and pay a fee every month in advance or something. They'll say, yeah, we don't really do well during the winter. Management won't even let us get our money back for rain, rain, rained out days or something like that. If there are issues, if you talk to some of the vendors, you're going to people are pretty honest. I find. Yeah. I'm, so that's a good way to find out. Yeah. And you're gonna find out if the policies are good too. Just in general, just by walking around, you're gonna see. One of the things to look for is how the employees treat customers, and if you attend as a customer ahead of time, you get a sense of that. And that's important because whoever's public facing, even if say you're just one little shelf in a big antique mall, your brand and your goods are now going to be associated with that place. And we'll talk about that. Like branding and merchandising is pretty important. But um, you definitely, especially if you're paying like a rental fee for inside of a brick and mortar space, Whoever's running the place, you need to get a sense of how the people that are public facing treat customers and vendors in that space. Yeah, they're essentially your brand ambassadors. Yeah. Yeah. And it it can be, it can drive foot traffic away and it can bring people to you. And it could be a really good thing or a really bad thing. So just know what you're walking into ahead of time. Is that a fair? I absolutely. It's always good to get that, that heads up for sure. That's key ask what they're doing for you the owner yeah you should be if you're running a business not everyone is William and I talk talk about this sometimes some people are running what would be called like a vanity business and that's not a a a, a nig or a hobby yeah or a hobby business is another way it's like a hobby novel or vanity novel same idea they're doing it for the passion of it they're not necessarily interested in the profitable bottom line or even if they are it's it's not they're not really tracking their expenditures in such a way to really approach it as a business maybe it could be we some of the best people we know are retired and they enjoy it because it's a social yeah It, it really gives them something to do they're you know probably Profitable, but they're not really tracking their profits and making it like the end all of what they do. Exactly. Uh, but if you are running a business, you're running a business. William and I run a business. We run more than one business. With a capital yeah, B. not just this, not just Dead Gentry. We run a couple different online and physical businesses. So it's you. You have to. So when I'm talking about the business side of things please understand this is a video for those people who are interested in running a business and being profitable and the things you need to know and watch out for for sure and not necessarily if if you're doing you know what you call just your hobby that's fun yeah and you're not worried about it so if you're running a business what can the landlord do for you what is the event that you're paying a fee for doing for your brand, for your business? What are the so- services you're paying for? Uh, that's a question you should be asking yourself. What is this place doing for me? And you might walk into a space because you just re- really want a physical space. I've seen this where some of our friends will be like, oh, I just want a physical space to sell from. They're all excited about it. And then they and they're not approaching it from a place of, Is this going to make my business better or more profitable? They're approaching it from a place of, I really want to do it. Yeah. And it's not always necessarily the best idea for your... What are you looking at? What? Kind of distracted like a Was there a cat? Oh. (laughs) Well, he's like looking out the window like, is it a fox? We saw a fox here. We saw like three once in the evening. Yeah. We Um, digress. (laughs) Is it a deer? Okay. So (laughs) anyway... um, I have no idea what I was just talking about. I like just totally like gone like flora and fauna in my head thinking about deer in the backyard. We were talking about 
is it don't just get a, a booth space or, or a space just to get oh one. yeah ask yourself yeah. what is this doing for me yeah. and if it's or not what do you, what do you want making you money you? Yeah, exactly yeah what is it what am i paying for and if you're like oh i have to pay too much for too low of a dividend for you know a profit on return then what is your business what is that space doing for you through no fault of the management or the owner nothing good yeah so that's something you have to keep in mind uh, and then if you walk in and you say what is this place doing for me and you're answering other questions like they don't market there's no good foot traffic that, that is on the kind of the head of the owner or the management but that could be another way in which it's not providing a service it's not doing anything for you or your business for sure so you, th- think about it that way what is what is i'm paying for a service as william likes to put it when a lot of people seem to think that when they work in antique malls or something as vendors that the customers are the customers of the ownership or the leaser and they're not the vendors are the customer of the ownership of the leaser. The people paying the rent on that space are the customer. Am I saying this right? Yes. Okay. Expound on that. Like, <laughs> yeah, you know I what mean, I mean? Because oftentimes the, 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 you know, the owner of the, the space will only see the, the people buying the, the items or the goods as the customers and, and treat the vendors as kind of tools with which to get to those what they consider customers. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. The good ones, the good owners or, or, or lessors will look at the vendors and, and realize that customer service applies to their vendors because they are paying the the, the rent rental booths and then they're paying the commissions. So really it's it's about making the, the vendors, the vendors happy. happy as well. Yeah. Um, if the vendors succeed and, and stay a while and, and be profitable, so will the, the owner. So yeah, again the, the good ones see see them as the, the customers as well. So it's you, and you can kind of get that sense pretty quickly. Unfortunately, if you're in a highly populated area, say yes. like the place I mentioned earlier in the video, right. video that I'm not going to mention by name, that we were only there for two weeks and got out. Yes. Because they have such bad practices. When William's talking about they should want you to be profitable because it makes them profitable, generally, as a rule, that's true. But there are some of these places that are incredibly profitable because they're taking advantage yes. of their vendors and they have an incredibly high vendor turnover and they're taking something like 15% commission on top of three and a half dollars per square foot on top of $65 unpaid work salaries per month or from all their vendors have to work at the store or something like that. And then they don't care that their vendor turnover is high because they're being profitable by making sure their vendor turnover is high. What they're doing is taking all these would-be entrepreneurs and would-be small businesses and sometimes artisanal crafters that really care. And, right. and and then they're just really taking advantage of them, draining them for as long as they can. And then when that person can't make it, turning on to the you next know, like, person because there's 15 yeah. other people that want that space that don't know any better yet. Now, when I've seen that happen... I, we weren't prepared for it in this last place. And so that's something to think about too. With all of our years of experience, all the different places, all the vetting we do, you can still fall into that trap. Yeah. So it, sometimes it can be very well hidden. Sometimes there could be a lot of dishonesty going on. You're not really made aware of things or bad policies that you're not aware of yet. So one, if it happens to you, don't think it's your fault and because it, it happens to the best of us mm-hmm. and get out quick i'd say cut absolutely yeah. don't be afraid to cut the cord <laughs> cut the sure. cord <laughs> yeah losses, you so. gotta know in business you've gotta know when it's costing you more even emotionally to remain somewhere than it is to get out and salvage your brand and salvage your time and your wages yes. um and then also there's kind of like i've only it's usually in a high population areas where people are so desperate for retail space and there isn't a lot of it. So there's always going to be that rotating line of people just waiting. Yeah. So it can look like, oh, people really want to get in here. They do really well. But what's really going on is they're just taking money from the vendors and never caring. And the, the saddest part is, is when it's a lot of small businesses and these people come away crushed. Yeah. And, the, and it's just like of all the people to take advantage of. And I've seen that happen. It's not everywhere. And it's no, not sure. all the time. No. And I don't want people to think that because William and I are in some places right now that are incredible. Um, we've actually limited a lot more of our like labor intensive engagements for where sure. you have to go for like one eight hour period somewhere or something because it's very physically exhausting. And when we approach our business as a business, our bottom line does better when we're not engaging those activities that we might not be getting paid full time for. Exactly. So that's another thing to think about that sparked any light bulbs for anyone. 
But if you have a good booth and there are good policies and the land owner, leaser, event management, whatever it is, is aware that you are the customer and that they want to satisfy you and that they're there to help you in your business, then you can have great relationships. But they should be able to think of it that way, understand why you think of it that way, and completely appreciate that. So questions to ask when you're thinking about this. What are you doing for me and my business in this location, right? Do they advertise? What is their marketing like? Do they do social marketing, like online social marketing? Um, Do they have any marketing? Do they have signage out front, right? Like, do they have more than just a window that says Mm -hmm. antiques? Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes people will pull things out of a store. I've seen that in a couple of really nice antique places where they'll like to take some bigger items that they'll pull out onto sidewalks because maybe they're just trying to get Eye some catching, yeah. visual engagement from passersby. Yeah. Uh, you know, are you networked into other events that they might do? Are they thinking of doing other events? Are they thinking of expanding? Things like this. So um, just remember... And I'm not me. We know some people that are owners and landlords. So this is in no way intended to promote the idea that all owners, landlords, renters are bad. Because it's not the case. No, Ours are great. Which is why we know better to get out of places that are bad. Um, because they really to, care. Yeah. I think we're just trying to lessen the learning curve. Or yeah. Out there. But, these, you know, you've got to think of it this way. And the people we work with would not be offended by this because they know this and they're honest about it. They're going to make their rent per square foot. If you're paying rent for a space, like you pay a fee for per square foot for like a shelf or a booth or a room, that's a no risk investment to them. They're covering their rent on that space from their vendors at no risk to themselves because they're getting paid rent up front and that is now covered. Utilities might also be covered. Their salaries might also be covered. You uh, And and I'm not saying that they have to disclose all of that information with you, but some of the financial information should make some sense and they shouldn't be afraid of explaining to you what's going on, Mm -hmm. why the rates are the way they are. And if it seems like you're being drained dry, you probably are. You're probably being taken advantage of. Um, but if they are working, like maybe it's, we know some family owned places where it's five, six people working there and they keep the place open six yeah. days a week, they right. need a salary. Right. So the rate's going to be a little bit higher, but then you're not expected to work there as a vendor exactly. because they have salaried employees, which are their family members. And obviously this will change by geographic location. And, and oh city. yeah. So just be, California is expensive. Yeah. <laughs> so can go you know, shop around essentially compare and you can start to get the feel of who's overcharging and who's under delivering right and then where where the sweet spot is and they shouldn't have a problem with that nope you should i mean i'm not saying you have to promote it when you're trying to get into a place where maybe there's a wait list but no one should have a problem with you saying uh, yeah I'm, I'm going to a few different places and trying to figure out the rates and the demographics of the area and what works best for me and my business yeah and they should be competitive to some degree it shouldn't just be taking money out of that space and never investing money back into that space you know, the best places we are do market. They do advertise. They do invest into their vendors. Yeah. They do care. They're constantly maintaining the, the actual brick and mortar venue. Um, so, and, and they realize that if we're expected to work, which we, we prefer contracts that allow you an option to opt out of that at a discount or at an extra price. Yeah. But that, that your time is valuable. Now, this is one of these big red flags. Big red flag number one. What to watch out for when you're getting a physical space. Don't take bad advice. Do not listen to these people in these Facebook forums like Antique Booth Talk where it's all owners and management trying to put themselves out there as if they're vendors when they're not. Yeah. What they are is owners and management. And just really being, just saying the most awful things. Like don't get appraisals. All appraisers overprice things. If that was true, the appraisal industry wouldn't exist. When they say things like, oh, it's hardly any time at all to work your shift once a month. Well, if it's hardly any time, they can do it themselves or they're not they're not appreciating and valuing you yeah. as an employee and your time, Absolutely. which is worth a minimum wage yeah. and should be in that way accounted for. And if they're not accounting for it that in that way and they're just demanding you work, why haven't they thought about that? Mm-hmm. That's frightening. Um, and that's any state. Whatever the minimum wage is in your state. And even the people who are like, oh, well, I just I like to volunteer my time. This is not the arena for that. In a business, time has a value. It's necessary to social and cultural structure. It's necessary for people to feed their kids and have a mortgage. So even if you have the extra time or the extra money to give, you might be harming someone that another vendor in your space that does not. 
And so, it, you know, you just have an awareness of that, that it's actually not just insulting, it's very harmful to tell someone else that they should work for free because you want to. I've seen that sort of thing and it's actually not okay. That's not how a business works. Those people are not aware of their bottom line or they're being dishonest in some other way. I've seen it where the people yeah. who say those sorts of things are getting booth spaces for free while vendors are paying. Because they're a friend of the family or something. They're the first people to tell you, oh, your time isn't worth anything. Yes, it is. It absolutely is. You And as a business, you should be accounting for it on your bottom line and paying yourself a salary. That's part of whether or not you're profitable. It has to do with whether or not you can pay yourself an hourly wage. Yeah. Not that you're actually like taking that out of the bank account every month or the you know the business <laughs> like group joint account. But it, because you have to think of it that way. You absolutely do. You're not profitable if you're not getting paid. And anyone who tries to convince you in any way that you shouldn't or it doesn't matter, they're either taking advantage of you or they shouldn't be giving advice. Yeah, or they're, they're like you said, they're not in the same business as you are. So you shouldn't listen to them. And they haven't stopped time. to think about people who sure. are. And it, it can do a lot of damage. Yep. Um, you know, watch out for the revolving door. Yep. Watch out for these spaces. They're, and again, not the ones... It took a lot of experience and practice to get into some of the right places. But you you can tell if there is no waiting list, if you're signing up with six people all at the same time, like unless they've recently expanded. Yeah. Or something. Well, some large um yeah. but why is there a constant revolving door? Why are so many spaces available? Why isn't there a waiting list? If there is a waiting list, are you told about it honestly and professionally? This is kind of how many people are in front of you. This is kind of, you know, monthly, what are turnovers like? And it could take X amount of time. Or are they just saying, your name goes into a stack and we'll just ignore it for a year or two, maybe get back to you. That's not very professional. There are better ways to go about saying things like that. You can say, yeah. we do have a vetting process. It's not what we call a waiting list. Right. But it can take up to two years for a space to become available. See, now that sounds, oh, well, that sounds like a great place that no one wants to leave. I yeah. get it. That makes perfect sense. But if somebody's like, oh, just leave your stuff here and we'll get back to you or not, and you don't hear from them in any way for like six months, that's very unprofessional. Exactly. So that's already a bad sign that other things within that business might be handled unprofessionally. Um, you know, you, you have to remember the rent is paid before a sale is ever made. And you're the one doing all the risk investment. You're the one doing all the labor. You might be transporting things there. You might be cleaning things, tagging things. You're the one who has to go out and spend time finding these objects. That takes a background in education. That's also an investment of your time. Yep. And all of that matters. So what is the place doing for you because there's no risk investment to them sometimes especially if it's an owned space and they just outright own it it can just be a money grab where they're just taking money out with a constant revolving door of vendors especially in highly populated areas yeah. where there's always going to be a line of 30 more people who don't know any better yet and it's these small businesses that just get crushed and taken advantage of by these practices I think they can't make their rent. They can't be profitable. When what's going on is they're being overcharged and no one cares that they're going to have exactly. to leave. So keep an eye out for that sort of thing. We've experienced it. I think a lot of people have experienced it, and it's really gross. And if there is, like, a management system, make sure they're not breaking the law. I mean, I've seen it. We've seen That's it. That's a good practice. Yeah, yeah sure but, it, you, but you should you you can you can educate yourself. These things, a lot of these things are easy to look up. Like people are not allowed to ask in our state. I don't know if this applies to every state, but I know in California there are laws around making people disclose their usernames, their passwords, For forcing media. them to join yeah. certain social media accounts, yeah. forcing them to, to give reviews in exchange for discounts. All of those things are incredibly bad dark policies. I've seen them. And it'll be the first thing. It'll be like, oh, we give you a discount on your rent for for doing five uh, review postings a month. I'm out the door. I'm already out the door. I can never have a patron yeah. finding out that I'm involved anywhere that would... It's bribery for false reviewing practices. Yep. Um, so no thanks. Bye. <laughs> you know, like not doing that. Mm -hmm. And why can't you get good reviews the way you should? Organically. Yeah, yeah. by treating people well and, exactly. and having a good business. And why aren't you caring about that? Um, right. And people should never be disclosing your personal information online. We had that happen in this last place. And when the ownership was told, they, they didn't care. They decided it wasn't their problem, even though it's literally illegal. That's considered in our state employee 
privileged information yes. that you can't disclose in social media forums. Um, like you can't give out someone's phone number because you read it in their employee file. And like you can't do that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. So obviously watch out for that sort of what I would call obvious stuff, but maybe not everyone knows that that's kind of obvious stuff to look for. Yeah. Um, if they're not disclosing to you what your salary is, you know, if you're working someplace repeatedly, say maybe working the space, then it should be in the contract somewhere that you're getting a discount on your booth for working those hours. And here's what the hourly wage or be discounted is. Or maybe it's, you know, you work a certain amount of time and therefore the booth just at sign up is less or something. But there should be some awareness of what that time's value is. Yeah. And if there isn't, something's weird. Also, if they use words like co-op when it's not really a co-op, that's getting into a legal misinformation about the difference between an employee and a contractor, subcontractor, independent contractor. Yeah. Uh, a co-op is not, it's like it, you have a voice. You're very much, you're all on the same level playing field. It's yeah. not ownership makes decisions. Ownership charges you rent. Ownership makes you, you know, pay a commission. And then ownership tells you you have a co-op working shift. That's not a co-op. No. Um, sure. So watch out for stuff like that. If it is a real co-op, it'll have beautiful, lovely policies and practices inside of it. It'll all be written out and explained to you. You get a share, profitability margins, and all these other things. So that's a totally different thing. Yeah. It's kind of like when um, you see you see that word used by icky people in icky contracts, co-op, used incorrectly. And then they'll also, these are the same people that'll say things like, we're a family here. Yeah. No, you're not. You're making a risk investment with a lot of labor and time. Now, that's not to say, like, we have some great pl places we work that I do consider to be family now right. and incredible friends and friend groups. And we're networked very well in that way with good people. But when we were signing our contracts and had not met them, they did not say, well, we're a family here and you're expen expected to act like a family member and maybe do favors for free or work for free or clean for free or what no you're not a family when you're paying someone money that's a business transaction and you're doing business they'll also use words like oh we're all partners if you're paying rent to an owner and you're not getting some share of that rent cost from all the other vendors. Yeah, you are not perfect. partners with that yeah. owner. So that's another weird. Now, what if they're saying is we like to foster an environment right. of, of friendliness and partnership where we work with you. That's a whole different thing. Yes. But when they're saying things like, oh, we're all partners here, which means you have to do extra work and they don't have to pay for it. They're lining their pocketbook. They're lining their wallet with your money. And they're absolutely taking advantage of people who probably can't afford to be taken advantage of. William and I have actually been in places where we could afford to stay because we actually do very well. Like we make a lot of money. Like in this last place, we were already restocking after the first week. We were only there for two weeks. I had weeks. to flee for my life. Two but, whole weeks. Um, 14 days, which by the way, was a huge time investment. It, it was It was financially harmful to us, yeah. but no one to cut the cord. No when to stop letting them hurt you and get out. Yeah. Um, anyway... Don't let them convince you with these sorts of flowery words that, like, it means you should work for free or work harder. Uh, that's usually not a good sign. Right. Usually, the, it, the the best people we've met will be very upfront. These are our practices. These are our policies. Mm -hmm. Um we, we want you to voice any concerns you have. We'd love for you to come to us with our ideas, especially maybe in slow periods or seasons. So, but they don't usually dictate and take advantage of and do these other icky kind of money grab things. Um, and if that happens to you, please don't blame yourself. I have seen so many like artisanal crafters, even like small businesses, local vendors, People who work with their hands, who are very creative. Also, like, people who are working to just, like, resell vintage items and spend a ton of time preparing inventory and then moving into a space get, like, very much taken advantage of in this way. There are ways to avoid it. But if it happens to you, first of all, know that your business never had a chance to grow or even survive in that environment before you even started. Okay? So that is not your fault. If you're not making your rent and any of these bad practices or policies are going on, it was never your fault. You just didn't know any better yet. 
And if you have to pull out, do not let it crush you. Do not let it make you think everyone is that way. I've seen that happen. I've seen people become very deflated, uh, you know, very demoralized by these sorts of things. You have to realize there are good people. There are good, you know, antique mall owners and mercantile owners and leasers and event Uh, you know, fee collectors, there are good ones. They are out there and you can find them. And, And the bad apples are not the entire industry. On that note, if you are in these Facebook forums, like Antique Booth Talk, do not talk in there. These are not safe places for vendors to talk. I have to tell the truth about it. These places are censored. They will remove accounts that disagree with them. They will, you know... You will get horrible advice from people that don't care about their time, don't value their time, don't value yours, uh, don't do what they do well, might not have experience or knowledgeability in it, but still offer bad or wrongful advice. And a lot of these places I've seen so many, I've seen evidence of like one person having seven accounts under seven different pictures and seven different names in Antique Booth Talk. And they pretend to be seven different people. And then they'll all pile up on someone's comment because they're actually the owner or manager of a space. And they're trying to undermine a vendor who's saying like, I feel like I'm being overcharged or I feel like there might be an illegal practice. And then you will get icky people in these forums presenting themselves as other vendors maybe even when they're not just attacking so don't think that's a safe space to ask those sort of, like even really don't even not, say yeah. like I've seen people like just for mentioning what their rate is. It's unfortunate. But and it's, you should be able to. There yeah. should be no problem with that. If right. someone is so defensive, so hypercritical, there's an issue. So don't use those forums. Make your own forum. Create your own network of trusted and valuable friends. Maybe you start locally. You can reach out to YouTube content creators as well. Like we make content. There's some really great YouTube content creators where you just passively learn by watching their videos the types of people that you should be asking for advice yeah. from. Don't do it in those forums like Facebook Antique Booth Talk. I have seen so many great people get censored from that specific forum and like 10 others just like it. And it's because it's owners and management trying to create the dialogue and control it. Like, it's almost like union busting stuff. It's weird and it's gross. Stay away from it. All the good people we know do not, they're not in there. (laughs) Like, the good owners, they're not in there doing that. Or they'll be the first to say, you shouldn't be charged rent and commission and be an unsalaried employee and be told. So. You know what it reminds me of? Slightly off topic. It's like in the old cartoons where you had the, the person walk into a, a room or something and it's actually like a, a truck made up to be looking like a room it's like a false front that's kind of what that, that yeah room, that, those yeah and then suddenly are. you're moving yeah, suddenly and you're, you're like you're where am i going away. and now yeah now the <laughs> i thought this was a living room exactly. yeah. Yeah, well that is an old cartoon a safe space forum no no it's, it's not, not a safe it's, space it's, it's, it's generally bad. the, the a public internet isn't a safe space unless you've created the group that, that could just be end the sentence. Yeah. <laughs> or you're in control of a non-censorship practice. Right. Um, or because it does happen. I see, I've see. i seen it happen in real time over and over again. It's, it's, it's kind strange. of terrifying. Yeah. And then we just feel so bad. It's part of the reason we're making this video. When people have asked us, we've kind of been like, okay, we'll get around to like mm-hmm. some tips and tricks. Um, but... I mean, stay away. Stay yeah. away. That's something pe- I feel like vendors and owners and stuff don't talk about. D- avoid those spaces. It, I've even seen people lose their booths because they didn't know their manager or owner was in one of those sites. And then that person's doing something either illegal or dishonest or they just are or so toxic. defensive yeah. or toxic. And someone just goes, hey, I feel like I'm not making many sales. And then they're getting kicked out of their booth in a month just for even right. voicing that in a public forum. So, and they they had no idea that their owner was sitting in there spying on them. Exactly. Um, so just avoid it. It's cre- Well, if you want to survive someplace, first of all, ask, how hard are you trying to survive? Cut the cord. Get out. Like, mm. if, you, if you're already trying to survive... That's a toxic environment. That's how you talk about being in a poison vat. Right. I'm trying to survive it, mm-hmm. right? So what do I have to do to hide and keep my head down and not ruffle any feathers? That's not good. That I, you should be able to be who you are, have good practices, bring up concerns, bring up ideas, discuss things in an open forum and not be attacked. If you can't do that, something is wrong. Yeah, for sure. 
And it's usually the same people as we've experienced who will do things like share your email online, sell your phone number because they have it in your employee file, disclose the address of your work, which is privileged employee information, dates and times when you might work. At least in California, that's that, those are some of those are illegal practices. Yeah. They can also do things like, you know, misconvey the difference between an employee and an independent contractor in, in an effort to evade tax law and things. So it's just be aware that some of that is going on and the red flags are usually someone who makes broad generalized statements like all appraisers overcharge your shift is hardly anything right like like these broad kind of it almost seems oh like that's not negative but it is there there's negative things in there and you have to watch out for them if you can hear or see those things coming, then you know some of this other stuff is probably going on as well. Yeah. And just avoid, avoid, avoid. And sometimes you'll vet a place like we did and it'll still happen after you spent hours building fixtures and putting inventory yeah. in. And so sometimes don't blame I, you yourself. Know, the underbelly is hard to find. I mean, usually I see, unfortunately, that it comes out pretty quick. But I think for us, that's because we know what we're doing and we have so yeah. much experience in looking for it. Yeah. Um, but we're also, we've gotten generally, I think, very good of what to watch out for, which maybe some other people don't, just don't have that experience yet. Which is why we're making this video. Yeah. But even, it is still even happened to us. For sure. High population dense areas, I feel like, are, can be very, like, system, like, systematically problematic. Yeah. Because there is just a constant way for some landlords to keep harming small businesses and vendors endlessly without ever having to take responsibility for it. Yeah. So I, I don't see it as much in the smaller areas. I, I just don't. I don't know. If yeah, it's I a agree. demographic thing, I don't know. So, um, you know, is there a waiting list? There should be. There should be some sort of a waiting list. They should be professional about it. I think we talked about that. Information that you ask for, which is appropriate. Like, I'm not saying they should tell you, what their financial statement is that they disclose to their tax lawyer. Right. But I am saying, if you say, well, why is your rent per foot higher than the three other places in the area? Plus a commission, right? Yeah. Then they should at least be able to say, we are open six days a week and those places are only open three and we pay salaries to our employees or we take a salary that covers that cost. Or we invest X amount of money in this type of marketing. You know, or it, 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 I'm not saying they have to give you specifics, but they should easily, in a non-offended, very professional way, first go, thank you for asking, vendor. I think you're somebody I want to work with. You seem to know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> that should be their first reaction, and here's why. Exactly. And if it does seem too high when you start adding these things up, because you can go figure out what retail space in the area goes for. You can th That's stuff you could search online. Um, and you can go ask other people locations and things you can get a sense of that and if it's not adding up and it seems like you're being overcharged you probably are you probably are especially in the day and age of you might be starting the friend who asked us to make this video was kind of like how we started many years ago just selling small objects online which mm -hmm. is a great way to get started by the way For very sure. little overhead very easy to keep learning while you're going shipping costs can be low as long as you stay in the right type of items and objects yeah um you know, and then there's a lot of venues to do it from. Unfortunately, those venues are constantly changing, constantly updating their policies too. Like I think Etsy's on the verge of making offers allowable now, which is horrifying. It's what destroyed eBay. Yes. Um, but you can start there and then expand into a physical arena. But if it's not making sense for you financially, because maybe it just is too expensive, no fault yeah. of the landlord then don't do it. So you need to figure that out. You kind of need to figure out where are you profitable and how. And if you're not profitable, don't think you have to have a physical space, I guess is what I'm saying. Don't get so excited about it. I just want to do it. Um, because that's not business sense. Exactly. Does the place, the owner, the event, what, the mercantile, the artisanal farmer's market, I don't know. Does it make it easy and friendly not just for the vendors, but for the customers as well. And think about both. What is the parking situation like? Is it easy to walk to or get access to? Mm -hmm. 
Um, you know, because as William's always saying, you, the vendor for the person you're paying a service for, you're paying, when you're paying rent, you're paying for the service of the space. Yes. When you're paying a commission, you're paying sometimes for other services, employee salaries, utility bills, credit card charges, things of that nature, which by the way, here's a big red flag. If you can't ask, what is your credit card charge? And they can't tell you 2% or 3%, which is why we charge you 10%. Commission, because it covers that 3% credit card charge plus some of these other things. Like, they shouldn't be offended by that. If you ask, what's your credit card? And they're, like, dodgy or, like, don't want to tell you what system they use. That's already, like, why are you trying to hide that? That's weird. And just tell me where it's included, how and why. And it doesn't have to be very specific to be very professional and disclose to the vendor what the charges are and kind of why. Yeah. Um. So people who avoid that, be aware of that. But, like, if... If management, if ownership doesn't embrace these sorts of questions or concerns, you might have concerns. Maybe there's a safety issue. I mean, we've seen some places that are incredibly hazardous. Um, and we're like, we would. I can't tell a patron ever to go there. The last thing I need is someone who invests in $8,000 oil paintings for me to go to this place because I suggested it and have a bookshelf fall on their head. Yeah. That's, um, not, that's, <laughs> not, that's not going to like, even though I'm not owning the place and it's not my insurance, it's horrifying. I don't want that to happen to one of my beautiful patrons. Right. So um, you, you have to think about it. You should be able to bring those concerns up at, at the very least, you know, is the parking, maybe you have to load and transport. Maybe you just do furniture. Maybe you're just like, I know people who just refurbish big furniture and have to have a physical location because it's not shippable. Right. Then what? where is your space within the building? Is it easy to get the six paint mirrored armoire from the French dynasty in and out? Right. Because you're going to have to load and unload and move things. So you have to think about, those are like the practicalities. So when you're looking at these spaces before you rent them, look at the spaces and think, what is the practicality of the space for me and my business? Now, if you're doing something like smelling tiny sachets of lavender, that's not going to be something you have to worry about exactly. quite as much. So, but you have to think about it. Just don't get excited. I know the propensity is to walk into a space and just be so excited that you don't start thinking about the logistics. So take the time to think about it like an, like an actual business owner. How often are they open? Are there enough hours of operation to make your payment to them make sense from a bottom line perspective is the shrinkage high here's something to think about what is shoplifting like can they answer those questions do they have security maybe they have an alarm system at night maybe they have employees on site that walk the vending area to watch for shoplifting maybe they have security um are the employees polite the public facing employees whether it's family members because it's family owned whether it's the other vendors that might be employed to work there they need to have tr- some level of training to work a till and be public facing and to be polite and friendly and have some knowledge. All of these things matter. Think about them. Hmm. Even if it's a farmer's market, I've actually gone to some beautiful like artisanal events, not just even farmer's markets, but like artisanal markets. And you walk in and the person who's running the event is so awful that you just want to turn around and leave before you even make it to a vendor's table. Yes. So you, you you can get a sense of that, I guess is what I'm saying. Check, see what the employees are actually like. Right. Um, usually, like at, like say that sort of a thing, they're like handing out a flyer and saying, here's the time of our free music venue. It's going to be over here on this stage. And, you know, here's a, like, it's, it's nice. It, it's a nice experience and you can tell. Will the owner work with you or do they just hand out ongoing ultimatums? I've seen that too. I've seen people get into situations where the rent is good, the rate is good. A lot of these things are great. And then here come the new rules and policies every week that they're just dictated. Everything in the store is going to go 30% off once a year now. Well, that wasn't in my contract. Yeah. Um, and Well, you don't have to do it. Just take everything out of your booth. Well, that's actually a lot of time. That's a salary wage that you're now charging me. Um well, just then mark everything up higher. Thirty. Well, if depending on how much inventory is in your booth, that could be two, three hours of your time. Just change all the tags. Well, then creating the tags. Is yeah. Longer. So you know, if it's a if you're being dictated to, yeah. sometimes these things are a good thing. Mm-hmm. But then they'll be approached in a healthy and good way. You'll have options for not having to participate, or you'll be asked if it's useful to you in your booth. Um, if you want to participate in it, it'll be discussed. I'm I'm just saying, watch out for that red flag of. If within the first month, two months you're there, you're being constantly dictated new rules. You know, oh, well, now you can't put anything higher than three feet. Well, before I had six, that lessens my inventory in half. Right. 
Right. Um, you know, these are things you have to consider. Oh, it's going to be the same rate, but we're taking half your space away and giving it to someone else. Well, why? <laughs> <laughs> how, how have your rates changed so drastically? And if you can say, oh, well, there's a real estate spike and you can go look it up for yourself and everything's doubled, then that makes sense. They, they're they trying to cover their rent. Um, but then again, that's part of that practice of always taking money out of these places is it shouldn't just be the vendor's labor and work making the rent. You know? Absolutely. It, the ownership has responsibility there as well. Um, you know, so will the owner work with you? Are they just handing out ultimatums? Do they blame the vendors or do they take responsibility when problems arise? I have seen bad ownership blame the vendors for even pointing out issues. Yeah. I've seen good ownership be like, oh my gosh, thank you for pointing that out. Exactly. <laughs> um, or even be like, oh, you know what? This isn't something I can do anything about. You know, it, it's not within the confines of your contract or I'm not willing to agree with you on this, but thank you for bringing this to me. But here's why I can't accede to whatever idea or suggestion or problem has arisen. Then they should be able to explain that to you. So, and, and there are situations when that happens. Yeah. Um, but it should never be like an ultimatum issue or them just like trying to maybe punish you or something. If When they call you a complainer, I hate that. That's a toxic work environment. That means they're defensive and don't want to take responsibility for problems. That's what that means. Um, they, sh- they should value people spending time talking to them about issues that might arise. If the owner is more interested in calling their vendors, you know, whiny than being aware of addressing bad policies, that's a bad place to do business. Absolutely. It's, it always is. So do they communicate well? Do they make you aware of things before you need to know them? Are you constantly begging for information? All of my businesses across the board, that's like 101. Not just vending, reselling, antiquing. My other private businesses as well, both online and off. If I am having to beg someone I work with for information that should have already been given to me, especially if I'm paying them, <laughs> that's a constant ongoing problem within that business that needs to be sorted out. Um, is it you know the other vendor's jobs to do the owner-operator's job for them? That's a big red flag. you know. So communication should be good. Things should be professional. And it should never be personal or emotional. There should never be a constant litany of excuses. I'm not saying that people aren't real human beings. And obviously vendors as well are real human beings. Things are going to happen. And there should be empathy and awareness of that. But if every time you're going to someone you're renting a space from and it, it's this excuse or that excuse or this excuse or that excuse for why they can't manage operate handle their business well then they're not managing operating or handle their business well and that's what that is and you're in a business relationship with them it's you know no dislike or disparagement to them but they might not be in a position to do that well at that time if they have that much other stuff going on in their life and that's you know you have to be aware of that and it does happen I really do see it. I see people mix like personal, emotional, very much manipulative things with not having to take responsibility for bad business practices. Yeah. And I think we should stop the video there for a second and make a second one because it's already getting so long. I agree. Yeah, it's a good stopping point. Okay. We'll make a part two, guys. Bye.